Hey man, KK, get my drink, wherever Michaela is, get my drink out of my office, please, and bring it in here. I think it's on the bookshelf. <clears throat> All right, Lamentations chapter number two. So uh, quickly, I just want to give you just a, a quick statement. I like to do this just to give a statement that summarizes the chapter. And this statement would be, the Lord has turned on his people Israel. Just about this entire chapter is concerning the fact that Israel was God's chosen people. This is one of the, no, 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 in the white cup. It's on the bookshelf. This is one of those, uh, chat, one of the verses, the passages in the Bible, I believe there's only three or four of them, where we'll find the statement, the apple of his eye, where Israel, the nation of Israel in the Old Testament was referred to as the apple of his eye. That's actually right here. A lot of the discussion is going to be about all of the different uh, divine things that God has put into place. The sanctuary, the temple, the priests, the prophets. All of these different connections that are made to identify the nation of Israel as God's chosen people. But the overall theme doesn't end there. It just discusses the fact that they are, yes, they are God's chosen people, but God has turned on his people. Now, if you remember in uh, chapter number one, it was basically the whole thing was just an, uh, uh, an allegory, uh, which was a woman that is weeping and crying, and this woman is Zion. It's the nation of Jerusalem. It's representative of all of the people uh, which are uh, Jerusalem or uh, those of Judah. And they're weeping and they're crying. And of course this woman, as I said, which is uh, uh, the allegory is, is made up of, which is this lady, she's also crying that no one is there to comfort her. Well, that actually is leading into the fact that the Lord is not there to comfort her. And she alluded to that a couple of times. She talked about how the one who comforts her is not comforting her. And that's speaking of the Lord. Who is the great comforter? It's the Holy Ghost. It's the Holy Spirit. It's actually called the comforter. That's the name of the Holy Ghost. So here in chapter number 2, that's really what we're going to deal with a lot. Still discussing Zion, Jerusalem, but specifically... Israel is God's chosen people and the Lord has turned on his people and he is punishing his people. Uh, so I want to begin here in chapter number 2, verse number 1. The Bible says, How hath the Lord covered the daughter of Zion with a cloud in his anger and cast down from heaven <clears throat> unto the earth the beauty of Israel and remembered not his footstool in the day of his anger. The Lord hath swallowed up all the habitations of Jacob, and hath not pitied. He hath thrown down in his wrath the strongholds of the daughter of Judah. He hath brought them down to the ground. He hath polluted the kingdom and the princes thereof. There in verse number one, we have Zion being mentioned again, and also uh, uh, being, being identified as being a woman. She's referred to as uh, the daughter of Zion. It says that the Lord covered the daughter of Zion with a cloud in his anger. A cloud uh, uh, can be symbolic of things that are good in the Bible, of blessings because it's bringing rain, but can also be symbolic of bringing storms, things that are bad. Like when people talk about someone clouding up and raining on them. Obviously that's meant to symbolize something negative. And that's what this is symbolizing here. The cloud is being attached to his anger. And then it says that the Lord cast down from heaven unto the earth. It says the beauty of Israel. So notice that God was the one that was doing all of the, the, the destroying of the nation of Israel. He was the one breaking down the walls. He was the one flattening the temple and the sanctuary. He was the one that was coming in and many people were killed and then others were carried captive. He was the one that brought about the famine because this is, if you remember from chapter number one, this is punishment from the Lord. The God is just using this heathen nation, Babylon, when they came in to punish the nation of Israel. They are just a tool in the Lord's hand to fulfill his will because the nation of Israel had sinned deeply and horribly. Now notice here it talks about the beauty of Israel and that God did that. He cast them down. And then he says, and remembered not his footstool in the day of his anger. That's also a very common statement throughout the Bible to refer to Jerusalem being special to the Lord. And that is the place of his dwelling. That's what it means is this is where he's seated. A footstool is where, you're, is where you're, you're, you know, your, your, your uh, uh, seat is located. So it's, it's meant to be attached to this is his location. This is his dwelling place. So notice in the very beginning, it's talking about how he's turned on the place of his footstool, right? Uh, the beauty of Israel. Verse number two, the Lord hath swallowed up all the habitations of Jacob and hath not pity. He hath thrown down in his wrath the strongholds of the daughter of Judah. So this destruction was coming from the Lord. The Lord was the one that was ultimately bringing this destruction upon them. 
He hath brought them down to the ground. He hath polluted the kingdom and the princes thereof. Verse 3, He hath cut off in his fierce anger all the horn of Israel. He hath drawn back his right hand from before the enemy, and he burned against Jacob like a flaming fire which devoureth round about. I want you to notice all the strong language. Uh, devoureth like a fire, his fierce anger. Just There has been multiple just strong trigger words over and over again that are just symbolizing in your mind or just uh, conveying to your mind just how fierce his anger is, how bad of a situation this is. It even said in verse number 2 that he hath not pitied. That's strong language. Saying that he has no mercy on them. While they're going through all of these atrocities, all of this pain, sorrow, and affliction, the Lord's not feeling bad about that. I want you to understand that. We oftentimes will pity people even when they sin and they do something that they shouldn't and then a punishment comes about from that. When the Old Testament, when God gave the law, and he would, he would specifically when he instituted and commanded the death penalty for uh, uh, just grievous sins, he would follow it up with a statement of, Thou shalt not pity them. Or thine eyes shall not pity them. Because oftentimes we have the proclivity or the tendency to pity our fellow brethren or our fellow humans because we're sinners. So because we commit sin, we can sympathize and relate to that sin that our other brothers... And, and, and because of that, we like almost give them a pass in a way. Well, the Lord is not a sinner. The Lord is perfect and righteous and holy. And that's one major thing that we don't have in common with Him. And so when, he, when we sin, He sees our sin actually as it is. And He's not biased because what we are doing is being unrighteous and being biased when we do that. He's not biased. He actually knows what justice is. And He knows that when a person commits adultery that they deserve to be put to death. So He doesn't pity them because He knows this is justice and this is righteousness. <clears throat> When the Lord was destroying them and all of these atrocities were taking place, I want that to sink into your mind. He was not pitying them. He didn't feel sorry for them. When they were screaming out and crying for mercy, all of those that had commit, committed lewdness and wickedness and horrible things in the past, and now they're being punished for it, He's not feeling sorry for them. He's not pitying them. I've said this before, and this is a powerful statement I believe as well, when the Lord flooded the earth and, and the entire earth is drowning and people are dying everywhere, God is not up on the, on the throne sitting there and flinching and feeling bad about it. No, that is His, his righteousness. That is pure ju justice and perfect judgment and He doesn't feel bad about it even slightly. Amen. The reason why we're like, well, that sounds weird. That's because you're a sinner. That's why. And you're sympathizing with their sin and you want to give them a pass, but He's a just God. And His mercy only goes to a certain extent and He will not violate His justice to be merciful. And right here it says that He doesn't pity them. Fierce anger, it talks about consuming, it talks about a fire, just strong, strong language. The same theme continues on in verse number 4 where it talks about him being their enemy. <clears throat> I want you to watch this. Verse number 4, He hath bent his bow like an enemy. So notice, he's talking about Israel. That's why it's bringing that up. It's talking about Jacob, and it's saying, He bent his bow like he was an enemy. Now, isn't that an odd type of scenario to paint in your mind? That Jehovah is standing there while, while the nation of Israel is, is, let's say, the woman being pictured as uh, in the allegory, right? And God, Jehovah, the one who planted and established Israel, has his bow pulled back like he's the enemy of her. Doesn't that kind of, doesn't it sound strange to you? Of course, because he's treated them so well, it was the nation of God. That's the point that it's expressing. Because of their wickedness, God has now turned on her. It says afterwards, he stood with his right hand as an adversary. Now, the right hand oftentimes uh, conveys destruction and punishment. The, just like in verse number 3, it says that he hath drawn back his right hand from before the enemy. Right? This is a statement that's used in the book of Isaiah. When it's talking about how he's pouring out his punishment. And then it says, afterwards it says, yet his hand is stretched out still. Saying he's still vexing them, he's still afflicting them, he's still punishing them. His right arm and his hand represents uh, punishment oftentimes. And right here it's saying that... That is, it says that he stood with his right hand as an adversary, saying he's hurting them. He's reaching out to afflict them and to cause pain with his hand and with his arm. And slew all that were pleasant to the eye in the tabernacle of the daughter of Zion. He poured out his fury like fire. Look at the strong language still. Watch verse number 5 again, this same theme. 
the Lord was an enemy. Notice that over and over again. He's their enemy. He's their adversary. He's turned against them. <clears throat> he has swallowed up Israel. He has swallowed up all her palaces. Now watch this. He hath destroyed his strongholds. Isn't that interesting? He hath destroyed his strongholds. And hath increased in the daughter of Judah mourning and lamentation. That's, of course, the title of this book. That's the name of this book, Lamentation. He is the reason that they are lamenting. He is the reason that they are mourning. He increased it. Verse 6, And he hath violently taken away his tabernacle. Again, the strong language. Violently. It was very violent. He violently took away whose tabernacle, does it say? His tabernacle. It says, He hath violently taken away His tabernacle. Just like it said, His strongholds in the verse before. Why? Because He is the one that established these. He's the one that founded them. He is the one that guided them and gave them the strength to build these. It's ref it keeps referring to the fact that, it's, that Israel is God's chosen people. And that these are His people, but now He has turned on His own people. And then it says... He hath destroyed his places of the assembly. He destroyed his own places of the assembly, right? The congregation, referring to where they would congregate, that's the temple. It says, The Lord hath caused the solemn feast and Sabbath to be forgotten in Zion. Who founded the Sabbath? Who was that? Jehovah did that. God did that. So it's saying he, he prevented, he stopped and, and, and uh, put a stop to the Sabbath, which he was the one that inst he instituted them in the first place. He caused them to be forgotten, it says in Zion, and hath despised in the indignation of his anger the king and the priest. Notice, he points out the king and the priest of Israel. So this is a common theme. You'll notice this over and over again. The Lord hath cast off his altar... His own altar. He hath abhorred his sanctuary. He hath given up into the hand of the enemy the walls of her palaces. They have made a noise in the house of the Lord as in the day of a solemn feast. The Lord hath purposed to destroy the wall of the daughter of Zion. So notice he purposed it. I'm being very repetitive because the Bible is. It's, it's focusing on a few of the same things. That the Lord's doing it. That it's occurring upon his people. And it's occurring upon the nation of Israel. And that he is destroying his own palaces, his own uh, sanctuary, his own temple. The, it is the kings and the priests, the Sabbaths, all these things that he instituted. <coughs> it says, uh, um, verse number 7, The Lord hath cast off his altar, he hath abhorred his sanctuary, he hath given up into the hand of the enemy the walls of her palaces. They have made a noise. Oh, I'm sorry, we read verse 7 before. Look at verse 8 again. The Lord hath purpose to destroy the wall of the daughter of Zion. He hath stretched out a line. He hath not withdrawn his hand from destroying, therefore. Notice a minute ago, I quoted when it talked about the hand or the arm from Isaiah. His, his, it says that his arm is stretched out still, right? That's what it's saying. He hath, he hath uh, uh, not. He, ha he had not. How is it worded? Uh, verse number... He hath not withdrawn. Yeah, he hath not withdrawn his hand. So notice he's still afflicting them. He's still punishing them. He hath not withdrawn his hand from destroying. Therefore he made the rampart and the wall to lament. So there, that's a, a perfect example of words that we may not use that often um, that are found in the Bible that the Bible defines for you. Just in case you are not familiar with a particular word, uh, the King James Bible, obviously, being perfect and, and uh, designed to give you wisdom, God's Word designed to give you wisdom and for you to learn, it expands your vocabulary while you read it. And one particular method that the Bible does, it uses words interchangeably. Like we just saw mourning and lamentation used interchangeably. In this exact verse, the word mourn and lament are used interchangeably. And then it even uh, goes further with another word and talks about languishing, I believe. Yeah, languished. In, in uh, that tense, languished, or that form, languished together. So right there, three, use, three words are being used interchangeably. Mourn, lament, language. So you, right, that's building your vocabulary. It's helping you to have a more expanded understanding of different concepts and ideas because they overlap, but they have slight differences. And once you understand that there are similarities, then you can kind of expand from there. You're building a bridge. And um, a word here that we don't use very often is rampart. 
We never use that word. Rampart just means wall, and specifically a wall of defense, right? And it says, it talks about the rampart. It says, he made the rampart and the wall to lament. A rampart is a wall of defense. That is the, what it is. It's, it's a wall specifically like in a castle where, you know, in a castle when you see like a, a lot of times in the Middle Ages or the medieval times, you see the castle and you see people standing up, right, and then looking down. It's because there's a parapet wall right there. People know what a parapet wall is? A parapet wall is like the wall that just comes up to about right here. Right? You know, uh, a lot of times when I'm working in new construction buildings and we'll go upstairs, you know, uh, or up to the roof, that's the type of wall that they have. They lay like a thermal plastic on the roof and it's a flat roof. It's not a pitch roof. It's on commercial buildings. And they'll have a wall that stands about four foot. That's called a parapet wall. Well, on a rampart uh, wall, the whole wall itself is called a rampart because it, the purpose of it is for a defense for a castle or sometimes it is, it is also called a rampart wall what uh, uh, is compassed about in a city like you know the city of Jerusalem which is what this is specifically referring to it's the whole city's wall and they'll have people standing on the wall oftentimes in the Bible it'll talk about people standing on the wall that is a rampart wall rampart walls always have because it's for defense somewhere where people can stand and they'll walk the wall remember the king would walk the wall, the soldiers will stand there and, and they'll look down and that a rampart wall will always have a parapet wall which is at the top which is where you're standing where you're able to look down over top of it. So that's what a rampart wall is. <clears throat> if you weren't familiar with what that word means. Verse 9, her gates are sunk into the ground, he hath destroyed and <coughs> broken her bars. Her king and her princes are among the Gentiles. So the walls mentioned being destroyed the rampart, which is for defense, is mentioned to be destroyed. The gates are mentioned to being destroyed back to back. The bars, obviously, are connected to the gates. Why is it mentioning that? It's, it's pointing out the fact that now they're defenseless. You know, which is a scary thing. Now you live in a city where anybody can come back in another time. The, Babylon comes back come, and attacks three times total. And obviously, once everything's torn down, how much more scary is it? Because the first time... They waited outside those walls for a long time. And the only thing that stopped Babylon from coming in and causing all of that you know, uh, havoc in the very beginning right away was the wall that they had. Now their defenses are totally cast down. They have nothing. Their wall is torn down. Their gates are torn down. Anybody can come in at any moment. He's pointing out the fact that now they're defenseless. Uh, her king and her princes are among the Gentiles. So they're among the heathen. Those of the nobles are among the heathen. You know they're not even God's people. The law is no more. So people aren't keeping the law. The kings and the princes being gone. They're not upholding judgment. That's what that's pointing out. And then it says this. It's, it's uh, specifically referring to spiritual things. Her prophets also find no vision from the Lord. This is another proof. I don't even think I use this in the sermon, Prophets and Prophesying. But it says, her prophets also find no vision from the Lord. What is a prophet? Is A prophet is, is someone that is a seer. They're referred to as a seer. And they, the reason why is because they see a vision from the Lord. And then they speak. Uh, uh, by being inspired of the Holy Ghost, they speak the word of the Lord. It's not just a preacher. It is very, it's more specific than a preacher. There are overlaps of a preacher and a prophet, but it, they're not the same. Right? A prophet specifically sees visions that are given to him divinely from the Lord, and then he speaks being filled with the Holy Ghost and speaks the inspired word of God. And it's saying, her prophets also find no vision from the Lord. So what does a prophet have? He has a vision. It, the Bible's so consistent. So many different writers, so many different you know, uh, uh, themes. They'll be talking about something totally different and they'll just make this allusion to something else. Her prophets find no vision. Just this vast, vast con consistency that so many people can, can overlook. And it just shows you, you keep studying the Bible, it keeps proving itself to be uh, uh, just so tightly wound and so accurate that no man could ever, ever pin these words down and come out with a book like this. Not possible. And you see in verse number 10, the elders of the daughter of Zion sit upon the ground and keep silence. So the elders are like the leaders. They're on the ground instead of standing up, instead of being in a position where they are within power and they look strong, they're on the ground and they keep silence. They have cast up dust upon their heads. They have girded themselves with sackcloth. Sackcloth is like burlap. Right? You know, like the, like the sack games that people do? You guys know what I'm talking about? When you, uh, what is it called? Sack races? 
Is that what it's called? A sack race? You know, that's what sackcloth is. It's, bur it's made out of burlap. So that's what it's talking about. They're, they're, they put on burlap. It's a sign of mourning. And it's meant to show humility to the Lord because it's very uncomfortable. It's like fasting. You know, you're sacrificing something basically is what it is. You're sacrificing something to show the Lord that you're sorry, to, to look at your humble estate and what you deserve. And so you put on this clothing that it's like itchy and scratchy. Can you imagine not wearing anything but sackcloth? It would be atrocious to do that. But that, the point of that is to uh, show humility to the Lord. So they're <clears throat> wearing sackcloth, the elders that is. The virgins of Jerusalem hang down their heads to the ground. And that, you know, their heads hanging down to the ground is also again a sign of humility, showing that sackcloth is a sign of humility. Mine eyes do fail with tears, saying I've cried so much but they've just given up is the point. Uh, it's very uh, poetic. My bowels are troubled. My liver is poured upon the earth. That's definitely poetic. They're not literally poured upon the earth. Talking about, he's referring to the feelings when you feel just overcome with sorrow. And that feeling in your stomach of just anxiety, extreme anxiety and emotions and sadness. And it feels like you're just, your insides are falling out, right? That's what he's saying. Um, for the destruction, this is why, for the destruction of the daughter of my people, because the children and the sucklings swoon in the streets of the city. They say to their mothers, where is corn and wine? When they swooned as, they, as the wounded in the streets of the city, when their soul was poured out into their mother's bosom. So we're going to stop right here just because the timing is perfect and we're going to go through some verses on the subject of wine. Because this is an extremely powerful verse on wine that, that demonstrates what wine is in the Bible. <clears throat> and this is an extremely important subject that many people are screwed up on. That is clear. And people feel as if it's not clear. I want to clear it up for you with the Bible. I just want to point you to the verses and show you how clear that the Bible is on the subject of wine. Now, I noticed this verse when we were in Arizona about maybe two, it would be three years ago now, three and a half years ago or something, in addition to so many other verses. There's so many other verses. I've, I've noticed other ones. Just over and over again, the Bible it, uh, will speak of wine in a way in which it cannot be referring to alcoholic wine. In a way in which it, it cannot be referring to alcohol, where it is for sure just referring to juice. And it's very obvious. Now, right here in Lamentations chapter number 2, we get the context and we can see by the end of verse number 11, it tells you, because the children and the suckling swoon in the streets of the city. And then verse number 12, so it's talking about the children crying. They say to their mothers, where is corn and wine when they swoon as the wounded in the streets of the city. Swooning is like turning back and forth. It comes from the word swine. And what, do, what does a pig do when it's in the mud? Wallow, exactly. Swoon comes from the word swine and they're rolling around. It's talking about them being wounded, rolling around. And they're saying, where's the corn and the wine? You know why they're swooning? Because that's what babies do when they're like kind of throwing a fit. That's how babies will act, right? Now notice what the children are crying for here. It says that they are crying for it says, where is the corn and the wine? Now, just to start here in Lamentations chapter number 2, if you took the word wine as being alcoholic and a beverage that causes the effects of, of to be, it causes someone to become inebriated and drunken, what you have is a baby on the ground crying out for alcohol. You have a, can you imagine your child? I want you to kind of picture this for a moment. Even someone as, as old as Carter, Brother Rick, or as old as James, Brother Hall, on the ground and crying out and asking for a beverage that is an intoxicating beverage. That he's just asking you, where is the, you know, I almost only want to say something like Jack Daniels or something along those lines. Can you imagine something like that? Where's the beer? Where's this? Where's that? Where's the alcohol? Do you see how ridiculous you make the Bible read when you do that? It sounds retarded. It sounds so stupid when you read the Bible in that way. Now, I've heard people say, well, it's not that they're consuming it, but they're just asking for it. It's, you don't know what the word swoon means, number one, because it's meant to paint a picture of them throwing a fit. That's the point. These are things that they're desiring. 
It's, it's them crying out for these things because they're no longer having them. These are things that they used to consume that they no longer have. It, it paints a picture that doesn't make sense even when you do that. Well, they're just crying out and it's meant to just represent that they don't have these things. Then why would they be asking for them? That's just you trying to sidestep the whole issue. No, it's because they're crying out for juice. How many times has your children, even in the past three months, cried and whined and said, I want some juice? If you gave your child water every single day, do you know what they would start crying and asking for? Juice. Do you know what they love to drink? Juice. Do you know what literally my kids constantly say all the time at our house? Can I have some juice? Do you know how often they come to me and ask for water? Not very often. Unless it's Jeremiah in the middle of the night, constantly. Besides Jeremiah in the middle of the night. You know what they ask for all the time? Juice. All the time. You have babies here. If you take this as alcoholic, you have young kids, toddlers and young children asking for alcohol. Ask it. Do you think that they were letting kids drink alcohol? Are you out of your mind? Right. It makes the Bible sound stupid. It'd be like, wine is wine every time in the Bible. If you look up the word wine every time in the Bible, that makes the Bible read very dumb. It does. It makes it sound ridiculous. And this is just one example. Then you have to explain these away. I want to go to some of these verses that prove this. Go to Isaiah chapter number 65, verse number 8. We're going to go to a bunch of them really quick. Isaiah chapter number 65, verse number 8. So we've been to this one already, but I want to give you a further explanation of this verse. <clears throat> I'm sorry, verse... Yeah, it is 65, 8, isn't it? Yeah, it is 65, 8. Um, <clears throat> I was in 66. It says this, Thus saith the Lord, as the new wine is found in the cluster, and one saith, Destroy it not, for a blessing is in it, so will I do for my servants' sakes, that I may not destroy them all. Now I want to interpret this little parable for you because I've heard a, a bad interpretation of this recently, and I'm going to give you the correct interpretation of this. Now number one, People have said, well, it's symbolic. You can't use this because it's symbolic. No, no, you're misunderstanding it. If, if, if you just try to blow the verse off like that, you're misunderstanding it. Yes, there's symbolism. But what he's doing is he's using something in nature, like the Bible always does, and saying, hey, that is symbolic of this. So this actually really happens in real life. And let me explain to you how I'm going to do this spiritual work. I'm going to do it like how the new wine's found in the cluster. Hey, you understand, because what the Lord does is He points to things in nature that we're familiar with and that we know, and He likens something spiritual unto something that we know and we can see and we can experience and we're familiar with. So you know what He points to here? As the new wine is found in the cluster, so am I going to do this. And He talks about a blessing, right? So what He is saying is this. He's saying, as the new wine, notice that, is found in the cluster. A cluster is a group of grapes. They are still attached to their vine. They've been taken off of the trunk vine, but they're still attached to their local vines with the small little vine. They've been taken off of the bough, is what you would say, right? There, it is not scientifically possible for the juice inside of that grape, and it says it's still inside the grape to be alcoholic. Not possible. Not possible because the yeast on the outside of the skin of the grape is what ferments the juice inside the grape. So until that juice comes out and lays among the yeast which, which grows upon the skin of the grape, it cannot become alcoholic, period. It cannot. Physically, scientifically, naturally impossible. But the Bible says as the new wine is found in the cluster. Notice that it uses the word new wine. Right? New wine. Now, new wine, the word, the, the phrase new wine in the Bible is exclusively not alcoholic. I've studied this out. I'm not going to go to Acts 2 right now, but I'm confident new wine every time in the Bible is non alcoholic. Now, new wine is, it, all new means is fresh. That's all the word new means. People try to draw the line and they assume that the line separates between alcoholic and non alcoholic. It just means fresh. That's all that it means. It means fresh, and something that's fresh and new is good. So it's saying as the new wine is found in the cluster, it says this, as the new wine is found in the cluster and one saith, destroy it not for a blessing is in it, so will I do for my servant's sake that I may not destroy them all. So the interpretation I've heard of this to try to, to, try to uphold the fact that it is alcoholic is this, that when, you dis, that, that when you take the grape and you squeeze it, you, sque you squeeze out the juice, the purpose of it is that it is going to be made for wine. So it's, it's in the process of becoming wine, therefore I'm going to go ahead and refer to it now as wine. 
And this is being likened unto how Jesus is going to be coming out through a process of among Israel. He's going to be coming out and he's going to go through this process and Jesus will come out and that's going to be the blessing that they're going to receive. Now that's a partial truth. They're still, they're, what they're doing is they're misunderstanding specifically what it's talking about here. He's talking about what the, 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 the overall point of this verse is that they're in a cluster. He's saying he's not going to destroy them all. But he's going to leave a remnant because of that particular remnant, Jesus is going to come forth. Because there's a blessing in it, I'm not going to destroy the whole cluster. But I am going to destroy many of them. Over and over again, the Bible and Jesus, and I'm sorry, the, uh, the Lord talks about in the Old Testament how he's not going to completely wipe Israel off the map. But he does kill many of them, and he leaves and he preserves a seed specifically that will come forth, like Noah was preserved. You know, and then it goes down the line, Abraham. And this is a theme throughout the Bible. Look at what it says again with that in mind. As the new wine is found in the cluster, and one saith, Destroy it not, for a blessing is in it. Watch this. So will I do for my servant's sake, that I may not destroy them, what? All. It's not to do with a process that's creating alcohol. He's saying this. There's a cluster here. And there's a blessing inside of those grapes, which is juice. Right? And I'm not going to destroy the whole cluster. Notice he says them all. I am going to kill some of them, but not all of them, because out of that I'm going to bring a blessing. Now, you know how out of that? You're going to take what's inside of it out. And you're going to go from here to here. That does not require an interpretation for it to become alcoholic. It's just saying within that cluster, I'm not going to destroy every last one of them. I'm going to destroy many of them. But I'm going to keep a few of the grapes, a remnant. And then out of that, I'm going to give a blessing. Here's the blessing. Squeeze the grape. Out of that came the blessing. Does that make perfect sense? That is the interpretation. How in the world do you think that this requires to be alcoholic? It's ridiculous. It's not found anywhere. Do you know what people, talk, you know what people will refer to verses? And I'm going to cover this in just a minute. When, al, when, when wine is referred to as a blessing, it cheers people's hearts. And they literally will say that's in referring to the uh, inebriated effect that it gives you. It's ridiculous. That's drunkenness, my friend. That's what that is. I don't care where you want to draw this stinking line of, of, of drunken, sober, here, here, buzz. I'm just buzz. I'm not drunken. That, if, it's, if, you're, if you're saying that I'm drinking an alcoholic beverage and it is making my heart merry, you're drunken, buddy. Right. That's what's going on there, my friend. Right. That's not what this is talking about. There's other ways your heart gets merry. And we're going to go over that right now. Let's go to a couple of the passages. We need to fly through these. Go to Isaiah chapter 16, verse 10. Isaiah chapter 16, verse 10. So we're going to see the word wine over and over and over again used where it's 100% referring to Jews. Hey, let me give you guys some information too. Did you know? Do you know what uh, Welch's grape juice was called? And this is in 1869. This ain't even that long ago. Do you know what it was called right when it came out? The first title or name of it? Dr. Welch's Unfermented Wine. That was the original name of Welch's grape juice. Look it up. 1869, came in a glass bottle. It was called Dr. Welch's Unfermented Wine. The word wine comes from the, the word vine. That's it. It, comes from, it derives from a Latin word, venum. V-I-N-N-U-M. That's what it means. In older dictionaries, all tons of older dictionaries, study the etymology of the word. It means... Grape juice. It can mean fermented, you know, uh, a grape juice, but it just means juice. It means juice from a grape. That's all that it means. Are you looking at it, Brother Rick? Dr. Welch's unfermented wine. You see the bottle? It's very clear and obvious. Dr. Welch's unfermented wine. Look at Isaiah 16.10. And gladness is taken away, and joy out of the plentiful field. And in the vineyards there shall be no singing, neither shall there be shouting. The treaders shall tread out no wine in their presses. You see that? They shall tread out no wine in their presses. I have made their vintage shouting to cease. Notice what they're doing. They're treading out wine in their presses. They shall tread out no wine 
in their presses. At the time that the grapes are being treaded, is it possible for that to be alcoholic? No, because that's the moment when it's busting the, the juice out of the grape. Right. That is the moment when it's being extracted or coming out of the grape. You know what? The Bible calls it wine. And I've heard pointed out, notice vintage. Well, vintage is where you make alcoholic. Do you know where the word vintage comes from? Vine. Vine. It's anything that you take. Do you know where they put their, do you know where they put their grapes when they wanted to make raisins? In their vintage. Look up the word vintage. Study it. There was a, a guy called a vintager. And that was the guy that after they treaded out, the, a lot of times their wine press was in their vintage. But there was also a guy called a vintager that would take it if their wine press was not in the vintage that would carry everything to the vintage. And that's where they would do whatever they were going to do with it. That's where they were going to store it. And they had tons. This is, it's also stupid when people say, okay, uh, they had no way of preserving it. That is not true at all. There are multiple methods that people preserved juice by. It's, that's this ridiculous attitude. That whether people understand it or not, it comes from this idea of evolution that everybody was ignorant before American came along. You know, we're just evolving and getting smarter and smarter and smarter. They had multiple methods of where they would boil it. They would do all different types of things to it. Steam it, and then they would seal it and put it in, and they preserved it. There, you can look up in history. Uh, Camella or something like that. A, a, a Roman uh, um, um, agricultural worker wrote a big book about all these different... It was actually right at the time of Jesus. There are tons of uh, ancient... Uh, methods of preservation. They and vintage just is where they took things. That doesn't prove that it's called wine being treaded out in the presses. Uh, go to Jeremiah 48, 33. We're going to see this repeated. Jeremiah chapter 48, verse 33. <clears throat> Jeremiah chapter 48, verse 33. And joy and gladness is taken away from the plentiful field and from the land of Moab, and I have caused wine to fail from the wine presses. None shall tread with shouting, their shouting shall be no shouting. Notice what it's called in the, in the press. Wine, right? Uh, go to, let's go to the New Testament. Look at these passages that uh, I spoke of in some of my videos recently. Go to Titus. Go to 1 Timothy 3. And then we're going to go to Titus 2. <clears throat> Brother Rick pointed something out to me in, in uh, Titus chapter number 2 that I totally, totally slipped my mind. <clears throat> I'm in 2 Timothy. Look at 1 Timothy chapter number 3. So people will try to use this to justify drinking. Look at 1 Timothy chapter number 3. Look at verse number, uh, what is it? 3. The first one, verse 3. Talking about the bishop, it says, Not given to wine. No striker, not greedy of filthy lucre. I want you to go to Titus chapter number 1. So what does that phrase, not given to wine, mean? People say, well, not given to wine means you're just not controlled by it. You're not given over to it like it's controlling you, right? That's not what that means. Not given to it means you're not visiting it. You're not going and seeking it. You're not looking for it. It's not something that you're taking part in. Look at Titus chapter number 1, verse number 7. This is also speaking of the qualifications of a bishop, and it says this in verse number 7. For a bishop must be blameless. Skip down to the very last statement. Not given to filthy lucre. Now, filthy lucre is dirty money. That's what filthy lucre is. Because people in positions of power are inclined oftentimes to take gifts. So it's saying not given to dirty money. Don't be bribed by people, right? So is there any amount of filthy lucre or dirty money that I'm allowed as a bishop to receive? None. So we can clearly get a definition of not given to here. And what, is the, what do those three words mean in this particular phrase? Not given to. None at all. So when we go back to not given to wine, how can we define that by? Don't tell me this phrase means something totally different. That's ridiculous. This is where people start stretching things. That's a way. You're not going to understand the Bible like that. Not given to filthy lucre. Those three words, when they were translated, and when those words were written down originally, the words, we have a perfect translation, they meant to convey not any at all. So you know what they mean? In, in Titus chapter number, I'm sorry, in 1 Timothy chapter 3 as well, can't have any of it. Not given to filthy lucre means you can't have any filthy lucre. Not given to wine means you can't have any wine. It's that simple, friend. That's all. Now, it's repeated again, and, and people get further confused when it's repeated in 1 Timothy chapter number 3. 
about the deacons. It says, likewise, the, must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre. So people say, well, now the deacon, he can have a little bit of wine, right? He's just not given to much wine. The bishop can't have any. That's ridiculous. That is ridiculous. The Bible is repeating the same thing, just a little bit of a different way. The first time it's just giving you the statement, not given to, right? Not given to wine. The second time it's just saying, not given to much wine. Let me just explain this to you. People that are given to wine are given to much wine. It's just repeating the same thing of saying, stay away from alcohol. Obviously, the focus of alcohol and the fear of alcohol is drunkenness. Everyone that drinks alcohol virtually gets drunk. I mean, there's almost no exception. I'm still waiting to meet the guy that actually does drink in moderation. I don't think he's out there, but if you find him, show him to me, right? So here's the thing. When it says not given to wine, it's saying the same thing when it says not given to much wine. It's just focusing specifically on not being a drunkard. People, this, let me explain to you the logical fallacy because I've said it's a logical fallacy a couple of times and people aren't understanding. The logical fallacy is this. And one guy thought I didn't know, I'm just saying that. A non sequitur. That is the specific logical fallacy. A non sequitur means it doesn't follow. Non means it's a negating. Sequitur means sequence, not coming after. It's saying that you can't say this, well therefore this, right? You're coming to a false conclusion is what that means. It's a non sequitur to say this. Well, because he said you shouldn't be given to much wine, therefore he can drink. That makes no sense. Now, that's like saying, that's just like saying this, and I used this example the one time when I preached a sermon about wine. Because it says, I, you know, thou shalt not kill, therefore I can punch Brother Rick in the face. It's retarded. It shows you how stupid this logical fallacy really is. It's because it says, shouldn't be given to much wine, therefore I can drink a little bit of wine. Wrong. Just because you, you know, just because the Bible says, hey, don't sin in excess, doesn't mean you can sin a little bit. Right. That's silly. That's what you're saying. But the Bible specifically focuses on drunkenness because that is the danger of alcohol. The Bible tells us not to flirt with it and not drink it at all because it will harm you because of drunkenness. When people get drunk, that's when... People here, the truth is that if a person took one sip of it, yeah, it's not going to hurt them. But God says, don't take a sip of it because this is what will happen. So both are sins. And just because he points out the extreme example being a sin doesn't mean that this small example is not a sin too. He, this is the preventative line to make sure you don't get here. Now I'm going to further prove that to you about the much wine. I want you to go over to Titus chapter number 1 again. So we see here, and also I want to further prove something else as well. So the first Timothy chapter 3, what I've heard somebody say, you stay there in Titus, Titus chapter 1. What somebody tried to say was, well, when it says likewise, it's not repeating the same thing. It doesn't mean, uh, they, were, they were saying that my usage was wrong of, of likewise, right? It's not saying that the same qualifications, it's just saying likewise the fact that there were qualifications for the bishop, there is qualifications for the deacon. Wrong. The first proof of that is just the, the natural reading of it. It repeats the same things. But number two is the fact that it says, likewise must the deacon be grave. And it just told the bishop to be grave. Have his children in subject, his subjection with all gravity. But the further proof of that is verse number 11. It says, even so. Now what is a synonym with even so? Likewise. So just like he told the, the deacons, now he's talking to the deacons' wives. And he says, even so. And look what it says. Must their wives be grave? Now, you are out of your mind and you are being dishonest if you say that that's not saying the same way the deacon's grave, the wife needs to be grave too. It's the same pattern that went from the bishop to the deacon, from the deacon to the wife. It's the same pattern. Even so. So it's saying the same qualifications. So you know what that means? In the same way that the bishop was not to be given two wine at all, which meant he can't have any of it, do you know what that means? When it says and it makes the statement that the deacon can't be given to much wine, it's still also saying he can't have any at all. That's the, it's the same point. It's saying the qualifications are the same. I'm just wording it in a different way. Stay away from alcohol. That's all that it means. I'm going to prove that further. As I said, go to Titus 1. It says, <clears throat> For a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God. Titus 1.7. 
Not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre. So even in verse number 7, we have not given to filthy lucre, not given to wine. Not given to filthy lucre says he can't have any. That means he can't have any filthy lucre. Not given to wine means he can't have any wine. Well, if you flip over to Titus chapter number 2, we have uh, not qualifications specifically, but we have standards that are given to uh, 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 the the other people in the church. And I want you to notice chapter number 2 verse number 1 says this. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. Now watch this. Verse 2. That the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. Now notice the word that was used there. Sober. You notice that? Sober. Look at verse number uh, 3. The aged women likewise. You notice that word again? Likewise, meaning in the same way, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness. Watch this. Not false accusers. Now watch this. Not given to much wine. Do you know what's synonymous there? Just like the aged men are to be sober, the aged women are to be not given to much wine. So you know what the opposite of not given to much wine is? Being sober. Do you know what it means when you're sober? You're not given to much wine. Those, those two things are, you're, you, when you're fulfilling one, you're fulfilling the other. But keep watching. It gets even more interesting. Teachers of good things that they may teach the young women to be sober. Now notice that. Why? Because they're not given to much wine. They are able to teach the younger women to be sober. Because they're not given to much wine. Because they're the same thing. Because it's just not given to wine, sober, not given to much wine. The Bible speaks in a general way sometimes and repeats things. Um, it says, to, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded. You notice that again? Sober-minded. Super clear. Now I want you to go to Proverbs 31. I want, you, I want to put a couple things together for you. Notice not given to wine is the same thing as being sober, isn't it? Now let's look at an example of where someone is told to be sober. Let me ask you this question, because people want to talk about, oh, what does sober mean? What's the definition of sober? What does somebody mean when they've been a drunk their whole life and they say, hey, I've been sober for three years? Does that mean they haven't been drunk? What does that mean? If somebody says, if somebody is a heroin addict, let's say they're addicted to opiates, and they say, I've been sober from opiates for five years. Does that mean that they've only taken enough opiates that would just still not get them high? But they're, so they're still considered sober. Is that what that means? What does it mean when someone says, man, I used to be an alcoholic, but I've been sober for five years? Clean. Clean. It means they haven't had any of it. You know what it means? Right. I'm going to rub this in more. Not given to wine. Right. That's what it means. Right. It means they haven't had any. That's what it means. In order to be sober, it means you're not drinking any. That's what it means. In Proverbs 31... What this woman, this mother, is teaching to her son is to be sober. Because I want you to pay close attention to this. Look at Proverbs 31 verse 4. It is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine. What did she just tell her son? Did she tell him not to get drunk or did she tell him not to drink it at all? Not to drink at all. Now let's watch why. Nor for princes strong drink, lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. Do you know what she's concerned about is going to happen when her son drinks? That he's going to not be what? Sober. So do you know what the command is? Not to drink at all. You know what she's telling you? Telling her son? You better stay sober so that you can have good judgment. Do you know the very first thing that leaves at the time when a person starts drinking alcohol, long before a person is ever, uh, is ever drunken and inebriated, long before they ever even would fail a breathalyzer, do you, know what, do you know what happens? You start losing. That's the very first thing that goes. You lose your sense of judgment. You lose your judgment. And at that moment, you are no longer sober. Sober means you're clear-headed. You're one of... You know, this is a silly discussion, and the fact that I even have to use these examples to demonstrate people's fallacies is ridiculous. It's, I could, then you, what you would be doing is saying, they would permit, hey, cut it out now. Sit your butts down now. I saw you guys fooling around a minute ago. Sit down now. Jeremiah, sit in a seat. Now. Sit in a chair and get out of that chair now. It would be like this. Think about this. 
It would, be, it would be like you would be, you would be permissible, it would be permissible in your eyes for someone to do drugs just so long as they were not becoming high. Right. It'd be the same thing. There's no difference. You could smoke pot as long as you just don't, as long as you're sober. You could shoot up opiates just so long as you're still, as long as you're not, as long as you're sober and you're not drunken. Right? Uh, with the opiates. You could go down the list. Where's the line at? That's why the Bible says, don't drink it. Right. Why? To be sober. So what are you told in order to be sober? Because don't disagree. This is so clear. that the, the, her, What is her command? Be sober. I don't want you to not be sober. Being sober is someone that is clear-minded and has good judgment. Right. That's the definition. You know what she's telling him? Be sober. And you know what she says in order to be sober? Don't drink. Don't drink. You shouldn't drink at all. The, there, where is, and, and like I said, where would the line be? If a person is drinking, where do you draw this line? Go to Proverbs 23. Where do you draw this line where a person is now drunken? Where, well, well, I'm still sober. <laughs> yeah. You know. Look at Proverbs 23. because that. I, I, if you look at Proverbs 23, there's something really funny about this. Because you know where your line would be if you took the interpretation that this is telling you you can drink? You can drink... But you just can't become drunken. Do you know what, how you would have to interpret this? That literally when you're stumbling and when your eyes are turning red and when the woe is already upon you. Watch, I'll show you. Look at Proverbs chapter 23. The end of the chapter. It says this. Who hath woe? Who hath sorrow? Who hath contentions? Who hath babbling? Who hath wounds without cause? Who hath redness of eyes? They that tarry long at the wine, they that go to seek mixed wine. Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth his color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. Verse 31 is, is such a clear description of fermentation. Like it's... it's if there's anything in the Bible that's not a stretch, if there's anything in the Bible that's a debated subject, verse 30, you cannot have, you will never come up with a satisfied explanation of verse 31 outside of fermentation. If you just type in, if you just type in on, on uh, Google, I just did this the other day, uh, uh, I can't remember exactly what I typed in, to show this to someone at my work. Because we were having this discussion because it was in my mind and stuff like that. And I just typed in something along the lines of, you know, uh, um, red wine is alcoholic. Uh, grape juice, uh, or the liquid from a grape is clear. I mean, it verbatim, and it even used the word, like, it, that it doesn't have color. If you take a grape and you squeeze the juice out of it, it has zero color. It is transparent. It is clear. This is a fact. This is a scientific fact. Go do it. Go buy a cluster of grapes and there's a blessing in it and you'll squeeze it out and you can drink the new wine. I'm serious. It's, it's clear. Amen. Now here's the thing. It has no color, but do you, know how, do you know what color it does turn when it becomes alcoholic? Red. Do you know why? Because it, it, uh, uh, the, the skin of the grapes, the, the pigment of it is red. And the skin dyes the liquid and it causes it to turn red. But you know what's also happening simultaneously? It's fermenting it. Because on the skin of the grapes is yeast. So there's a dual process that's taking place. So you know what you can't have? You cannot have red wine without having alcoholic wine. So, and do you know how people used to judge how alcoholic the wine was and at what point the process was? How red it was. So you know what you can do? You can look at it and say, that's alcoholic and that's not. That's wine I can drink and that's wine I can't. That's wine I should stay away from and that's wine that... I, that I can have. And do you know what else takes place? And it's not that you can't see it, you're not, you're not able, this is a lie. This is not true. I've looked it up. I've watched it happen on a YouTube video. I've seen, I've read forums about it. You, when, it when it is fermenting and it's at its fermentation processes, it's going through its fermentation process, you can see it bubbling and you can see the carbon dioxide coming out of it. You can see it! You can watch it happen before your eyes. They don't have to speed the video up. You can watch it literally bubble and move itself aright. Right. So it turns red. It, it, it gives its color in the cup. That means that it didn't have a color before that. It had no color and it turned red. And I've heard the explanation that the cup turns red. It says, look not thou upon the wine. There's your noun. 
when it is red. It is a pronoun pointing back to wine. It's not talking about the cup. You have to try to, you have to, try to paint this picture that they had to be using ceramic, or not ceramic, uh, uh, um, like pottery type cups maybe, cups. maybe they do say ceramic. Ceramic wouldn't work. I don't think so. But they would have to be like a pottery type cup and it stains the cup. That is a silly interpretation. Amen. That's goofy. That's not what the Bible's teaching. It's saying that the wine turned red. What is it saying? It's moving itself aright. What is it giving? It says when it gives it its color in the cup. Saying it's giving its color while it's in the cup. Distinction between the cup and it. It is the wine and the wine turned red. It wasn't. I mean, you can't break it down any more simple. It's so basic. It's so easy. It's saying there's a wine that you can look at that's not red and it doesn't have color and it's not moving. And then there's a wine that you can't look at. This is not just Baptist doctrine. This is Bible doctrine. It's what the Bible teaches. Amen. And it is a sin, and I don't care if people say, oh, you are, you know, this is a sin to say that uh, brethren shouldn't be drinking wine. And they point to the passage in Rome, Romans, and they're like, see, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be down on your brother for drinking wine. And so it's a sin to say that they're drinking wine. So that must be alcoholic. <coughs> it says the same thing about flesh. Is flesh alcoholic? They try to use that as a proof in the book of Romans. I don't want to turn there, so I'm not going to go down that rabbit trail. But that doesn't prove it's alcoholic either. That's just talking about juice. Anyways, it's the same thing. You don't know what the word wine means. Dr. Welch is unfermented wine. That is the definition of the word. There's so many times in the Bible where it's clearly two different types of wine. Look not thou upon the wine when it is red. There's a red wine and a wine that's not red. That is the distinguishing characteristics of alcoholic wine and non-alcoholic wine. Dr. Welch's unfermented wine was wine that was not fermented and non-alcoholic. Game over. It's super, super simple. Look up the etymology of the word. It's very basic. It goes on to say this. I want you to watch this. When it is red, <clears throat> when it moves itself aright, at the last it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. What does that mean? It's deceptive. When you're not prepared for it, it's going to bite you and sting you like an adder. It sneaks up on you at the last, saying, stay away from, uh, <coughs> excuse me, completely. Thine eyes shall behold strange women, and thine heart shall utter per perverse things. What was the, where did this start at? Look not thou upon the wine. The Bible warns you of drunkenness because that's what takes place when you drink alcohol. So people are like, oh, it's warning you of drunkenness, therefore you can drink. If I warn my kids of the, the, the you know, dangers of getting high, does that mean that I'm telling them that they can take a, a one puff of weed? No. It's silly. Obviously, the danger is that they would become high and that something bad would happen for that. If I warn my children of like snorting cocaine, does that mean that they can take an amount of cocaine that's just not going to get them high? Of course not. If I told my children, look at that drunken guy over there, that fool... Don't be like him. Do you think that they're going to walk away and say, oh, my dad means I can drink a little bit of alcohol, just not be a drunk? No, I'm saying stay away from alcohol. Right. Of course, the focus in the Bible is that drunkenness is horrible because that is the danger of alcohol. But the problem is, at the last, it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. The whole, that's why you shouldn't look at it. Because it bites, it sneaks up on you. That's why the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 20, verse number 1, Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging. And then it says this. <clears throat> Whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Why would they be deceived? Is the person deceived that, you know, drinks to the point where they just start getting buzzed and then they stop? Is it talking about the person that's deceived that's this guy right here? Of course not. It's a person that's in denial. That's what it is. It's a person that's in denial. And what is that person going to say? Oh, I can, I can charm the snake. Watch this. Watch me charm the snake. I can play with fire. That's an expression. If you play with fire, you're going to get burned. Right. What's the point? Those people would be deceived, wouldn't they? Wouldn't you say that person's deceived, that the person that thought, I can play with fire and not get burned? The person that's deceived by wine is the person that thinks, I can handle it. And I'm not going to get harmed or I'm not going to get hurt. That's the person that's deceived. That is who it is. I mean, it's as clear as day. Go to Deuteronomy 32. We've got to get back to Lamentations too. 
This is the last place we're going to turn. <clears throat> Deuteronomy 32. Now, I understand that there, is, that there are things in the Bible that are poetic, you know, proverbial, allegorical, and they can be a little bit... And, and there are parables and, uh, parables and analogies that are drawn, and there is an analogy here, but there's clarity here as well. And I want to demonstrate that to you. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 32. Isn't it early on? Isn't it 30? Yeah, 30, 31. Look what it says. For their rock is not as our rock, even our enemies themselves being judges. Now, real quick, what is the rock? What does the rock represent? Brother Hall, Brother Rick. What is it? Christ. The Lord, right? Jesus. The Lord. Christ. So there's an analogy there, but you understand what it's talking about when it says the rock, don't you? And what else do you understand? Their rock is not as our rock. What else do you understand? Christ is not their rock. They have another rock. Now, is their rock good or bad? Bad. The, there's an analogy here, isn't there? But isn't the understanding of it clear? The interpretation's clear, right? <clears throat> so he starts off easy because it's real understandable because he's laying a foundation and now he's going to build a pattern. Now watch. For their vine is of the vine of Sodom and of the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of gall. Their clusters are bitter. So just a moment ago he said, we have a rock, they have a rock. Not the same, good, bad. Now he says this, their wine. Now what is the clear implication and indica indication if we say, what is it indicative of if I say their vines of Sodom? What am I saying about my vine? It's not of Sodom. What is Sodom in the Bible, good or bad? bad. So is my vine good or bad? Good. And their vines, bad. So here's the thing. Is there a parable? Is it, you know, is there, is it uh, uh, an analogy? Yes. But it, can we interpret it? Yes. Let me just tell you differences. Now he goes to critique it. Their grapes are grapes of gall. Their clusters are bitter. The process of fermentation breaks down what? What is sugar? How does it taste? Sweet. So you know, this is, this is the characteristics of alcoholic wine. Do you know how wine, when it's fermented, tastes? Not sweet. Sour. That's how it tastes. It tastes bitter. That's how that's the difference is. It breaks the sugars down and the sugars leave. They're gone. And it's no longer sweet. So he's saying theirs is bitter. Do you know what it's not? It's not sweet. It's no longer sweet. Then look at what it says. Their grapes are grapes of gall. Their clusters are bitter. Now watch this. Their wine is the poison of dragons and the cruel venom of asps. Do we have the same wine as they have? No. Their wine is the poison of dragons. Is that good or bad? bad? Bad. Yes, there's an analogy, poison of dragons. Right. But we, well, you know what we do know? There's a poison. Just like the, the grapes were bitter, they were, what did that represent? Obviously the bitterness of alcohol, of wine. And there's a difference. It told us that there's two different types of vines, there's different types of grapes and what comes forth out of the grapes. But also here, it talks about there's, there being that their wine specifically is poison. There is a such thing as a poisonous wine today. And you know what kind you know what kind of wine is poisonous? Red wine. The wine that gives its color in the cup. The wine that moves itself aright. The wine that you are specifically told to stay away from. The wine that causes you not to have judgment and not be able to not be able to judge. The wine that's a mocker. The wine that's all the wine that is likened unto God's wrath over and over and over again in the Bible. Over and over and over again, bad things are likened unto God's wrath. And wine is likened to... And right here it says, their wine is the poison of dragons and the cruel venom of asp. Do you know when someone is drunken, do you know what they are? They're intoxicated. Alcohol is a toxin. It is a poison, literally. People get alcohol poisoning. Right. Yeah, I realize there's an analogy here, but it's not cryptic, my friend. It's very clear the understanding. There's two types of wine, one's poisonous, one's not. There's two types of wine, a red wine and one that's not a red. There's two types of wine, one that's bad and one that's good. One you can drink, one that you can't look at. You're supposed to stay away from. Go to Judges chapter number uh, 19. I know I said it was the last place, but I want to turn you on because I mentioned this already. Judges 19. So people talk about, oh, you know, even, people even say this. And here's the thing. I think people say it not knowingly. But this, it is blasphemous when you say that you know, wine cheers the heart of man and that's talking about it being alcoholic and talking about literally someone becoming drunken and buzzed. Because the Bible also says that it cheers the heart of man and God. They have God getting buzzed 
That's blasphemy. Right. That is blasphemy for sure. And I'm not just throwing that term around. It really is. And, it, and it, it loses its power when people on the other side are saying it about ridiculous things. Blasphemy. No, no, this really is. You're saying God is a drunk. You're saying God buzzed is drunk, my friend. You're not sober, not given to wine, not given to much wine. Sober, that person's drunk. So if you're saying that God did that, then God is a drunk. God got drunk. That's blasphemy. Look at Judges 19. I hope I know where this is. <clears throat> Hold on, I think I got it written down. I know where I have it. Give me one second. Judges 19. 9. Judges 9. Chapter 9, 27. Look at chapter 9, verse 27. Watch this. And they went out to, into the fields and gathered their vineyards and trowed the grapes and made merry and went into the house of their God and did eat and drink and cursed Abimelech. I want you to notice what just happened in that particular passage. It says that they went out into the field they trowed their grapes. And then it says they made merry. And they, what did they do? They ate and drank. Do you know what they drank? Take a guess. Juice. But do you know what they treaded in? A wine press. And do you know what was in the wine press? Wine. As the wine is in the wine press, right? As, it, as it's found in the wine press. Saying it's going to fail from the wine press. And do you know what it even says that they did? They were merry. At the same time, being used about that, the, that, that period of time, they, they were merry. Right? In the Bible, the, I can show you verses where the Bible says that corn makes man's heart merry. It's not meaning that you're drunken. No, it's a righteous type of being merry. You can be happy without being drunk. Right. There's different types of being merry. So they just say, hey, look, this guy's merry. Because there are times when people are drunken and it says they're merry. Yeah, of course, if you've seen people that are drunken, it's a type of merry, but it's a bad type of merry. Right. It's evil. And you know what they do? They utter perverse things. Right. right? That's the picture of someone that's merry from, from being drunken. It's a bad merry. But you know what else there is? There's types of merry from just eating corn and drinking wine as in regular grape juice. There's types of merry just being happy. Be, you know, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. That's being merry from going to church. There's, there's good happiness and there's bad happiness. Do you know what these people did? Here's an example of people treading out grapes and drinking them right away. To think that people never drank juice is ridiculous. To think that the word juice only comes up one time in the Bible and every other time is alcoholic is ridiculous. You don't realize. People need to take a step back and realize, here's an example of it. What about when they squeeze the grape juice right into the cup of Pharaoh? Think about that. What about when, I believe it was Ezra, who was the cupbearer of Cyrus. He stood there. He's squeezing the grape, right? People drank juice all the time. Not everybody was a stinking drunk in the past, in biblical or ancient times. It's ridiculous. Everybody's just, there's just like two options. What do you want? Brother Rick, you come in my house. It's like, you want, you know, uh, uh, alcoholic wine or water? Take your pick. It's ridiculous. People look at the world like where it's not realistic. The word juice that shows up one time in the King James Bible in Song of Solomon chapter number 8, if you look at the previous version, do you know what it says? I would lead thee into my mother's house. I would cause thee to drink of spice wine of the wine of my pomegranate. Wine of the wine of my pomegranate. Do you know how it's translated in the King James Bible? Juice. Do you know why? Because the word juice was not used very much yet. And it started coming into fashion. What happens with, if you study etymology, words are very generic and they're general, and then they go down a specific path. And if you say, wine is wine every time in the Bible, oh yeah? Well, I guess corn is corn every time in the Bible. I guess, I guess meat is meat every time in the Bible. So in Genesis chapter number one, when God tells them that all the herbs of the field and uh, uh, the herbs and the, uh, something else is going to be meat for them, and it doesn't mention any type of beef or chicken or pork at all, he's talking about meat like we call meat. Meat's meat every time in the Bible. That's a silly statement. Heaven is heaven every time in the, every time in the Bible? No, it has multiple meanings. Right. Corn is corn every time in the Bible? No. Just like when Jesus says, he talks about, uh, uh, you know, there shall not a, um, a grain, what does he say? A grain of corn fall to the ground. No, the wor they, words change in meaning. The word turtle in the Bible is referring to a turtle dove. Not an amphibian. You know what I mean? The, 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 you could do this all stinking day. 
There are so many words that change meaning and it, it's ridiculous to say wine is wine. No, it's not. Yeah, tell Dr. Welch. Tell Dr. Welch that. Wine is wine, Dr. Welch. No, it's not. It's juice. Dr. Welch's unfermented wine is not alcoholic, buddy. You can just study words, man. Just study, study words. Look at the Bible. The Bible is all you need. I shouldn't even have to go to all these other... These are all just secondary proofs. There's tons of other examples. The word wine is generic and it's general. And that's how words will change oftentimes. Let me make it very clear. Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Amen. If you can think you can drink alcohol, if you think that you can drink alcoholic wine, beer, I don't give a rip what you're drinking. If in that cup there's the possibility of causing you to become drunken, you are sinning against the Lord. Amen. Look not thou upon the wine when it is red. When it give it this color in the cup, if you think you can drink it and you're not going to become drunken, you're deceived thereby. If you think you can mess with fire and not get burned, you're deceived. That's what's going on. At the last it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. By the time you get to the point where you're already starting to you know, uh, uh, just, just feel buzzed and supposedly you know, when, it get, when it moveth itself aright, that's you stumbling. That's you like moving the cup around. It says when it moveth itself aright, by the way. But, but that's you like moving the cup around and like, you know, that's, you know, you're, uh, uh, <clears throat> what's the word? You're just stumbling. Let's just leave it at that. You're losing your balance and they're like, now you need to stop. Are you serious? Now you need to stop? Where do you draw the line? Because that, if that was your interpretation, that's what Proverbs 23 is teaching. That's. You, now all of a sudden, no, you were not sober a long, long time ago. Right. Not sober, not given to wine. Not given to wine, not given to filthy lucre. Now let's work our way backwards. Not given to fil filthy lucre means abstinence. Not given to wine, abstinence. Abstinence, sober. Right. Make sense? Right. See how we did that? That's the Bible as our dictionary. Right. That's allowing God's Word to define itself. And then we can look at History, Dr. Welch's unfermented wine. We can look at all these other examples and it just bolsters the definition. And look at, look not that upon the, it's so clear. I left out a ton of stuff. We got to go back to Lamentations chapter number two. We're probably just going to have to read this. <clears throat> Lamentations chapter number two. <clears throat> <clears throat> And right here, and this is where we started, you have babies crying for alcohol, according to the person that believes that wine is wine, as in our definition of wine, every time in the Bible. It's, it's ridiculous. They're crying for juice. It says in verse 13, What things shall I take to witness for thee? What things shall I liken to thee, O daughter of Jerusalem? What shall I equal to thee, that I may comfort thee, O virgin daughter of Zion? For thy breach is great like the sea. Who can heal thee? So he's saying, like, how can I comfort you by comparing you unto someone else? Because you know a way that we receive comfort? By saying, hey, at least you don't have it as bad as so-and-so. So he's saying, hey, what can I compare your trials and troubles unto somebody else's you know, so that I can make you, you know, a little bit more comfortable or feel better about it? His point is nobody. He says, because your breach is like the sea. The sea is vast and huge. He's saying nobody has problems or trials like you. It's meant to express how bad of atrocities they went through and how hard times it was. And then he says, who can heal thee? Of course, the Lord is the healer, but the, if the Lord can't heal him, then nobody can. Verse 14, thy prophets have seen vain and foolish things for thee, and they have not discovered thine iniquity. What should the prophet be doing? Same thing, what is the preacher supposed to do? Discover their iniquities. You know, lift up thy voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sin. That's the job of the prophet and of the preacher. It's the same. You know, prophet and preacher aren't the same. The job's the same. It's supposed to be preaching against sin. And that was the problem was because the prophets were seeing vain, foolish things that were lies, not from the Lord. The Lord wanted them to turn from their sin and, and would, it would have saved them from their captivity. But have seen for thee false burdens and causes of banishment. All that pass by clap their hands at thee. They hiss and wag their head at the daughter of Jerusalem, saying, and hissing and wagging and clapping their hands. These are all expressions of mockery like... That's kind of the hissing. We, we, we like think of hissing like, a, like a, a snake. You know what I mean? Like That's not what they're doing. They're doing things like, you know what people do when they laugh and they mock? What's the most common laughing mock? It's like, 
You're hissing. It's like a hiss. That's what he's saying. They're like, tss, tss, or like, tss, tss. and they're like clapping and they're wagging. What do you do when you mock somebody? <laughs> you like lean back and you wag your head around. That's what it's saying to try to describe this for you because it's a little bit different than how we would, you know, imagine it because the wording's a little bit different. Is this the city that men call the perfection of beauty, the joy of the whole earth? All thine enemies have opened their mouth against thee. So they're all running their mouth against them. They hiss and gnash the teeth. They say, we have swallowed her up. Certainly this is the day that we looked for. So they're rejoicing in her fall and in her failures. And they were waiting, her enemies were waiting for this to happen. We have found, we have seen it. The Lord hath done that which he had devised. He hath fulfilled his word that he had commanded in the days of old. This goes back to the cursings in Deuteronomy chapter number 28. Where he says, if you do this, I'm going to destroy you. And it's everything that you read about in Lamentations is what Deuteronomy 28 talks about. He hath thrown down and hath not pitied. And he hath caused thine enemy to rejoice over thee. He hath set up horn, uh, the horn of thine adversaries. Horn represents uh, um, uh, basically victory or salvation or strength. And the horn of the enemy, like victorious or salvation, is, is lifted up over them. Their heart cried unto the Lord, O wall of daughter of Zion, let tears run down like a river day and night. And remember, in... Uh, the previous chapter, the woman said this. When she it was like depicting the woman in the allegory, she said that she was crying all night and she had no rest. So that is pointing back to that. Give thyself no rest. And then it says, here's the statement, let not the apple of thine eye cease. The apple of, her, of his eye is referring to Jerusalem, is referring to you know, what was God's people, Israel. That is a phrase used multiple times about Israel in the Old Testament. Arise, cry out in the night, in the beginning of the watches, pour out thine heart like water before the face of the Lord. Saying, cry before him like water, just like tears streaming is the point. Lift up thy hands toward him for the life of thy young children that faint for hunger in the top of every street. Behold, O Lord, and consider to whom thou hast done this. Shall the women eat their fruit and children of a span long? Shall the priest and the prophet be slain in the sanctuary of the Lord? The young and the old lie on the ground in the streets. My virgins and my young men are fallen by the sword. Thou hast slain them in the day of thine anger. Thou hast killed and not pitied. Notice the few times it talks about him not, him not pitying. It's like the fourth time. And it keeps talking about it being his people, the prophet, the priest, the king. It's, the, the, the focus is God has turned on the nation of Israel. And it's his people and he's, he's punishing them as if he is their enemy. And then it says in verse 22, Thou hast called as in a solemn day my terrors round about, so that in the day of the Lord's anger none escaped nor remained. Those that I have swaddled and brought up hath mine enemy consumed. That last statement is a sad statement. It's talking about her children. She says, those that I have swaddled, like swaddling clothes is what you wrap a baby in like that restricts them. Like when you will uh, uh, take a, a blanket, and there's a specific method, I don't know what it's called, maybe that is called swaddling, and however it is, Mrs. Hall is shaking her head yes. So you swaddle the baby, and the baby's not able to move. Right? And they're not moving around and I guess that comforts them in some way. I have no idea the purpose. But then you put the baby to sleep. So she's referring to her own children. She says, she says uh, uh, those that I have swaddled, and then she says, and brought up. Like saying th that I raised. Those are her own kids. Hath mine enemy consumed. That's a sad statement. She's, the person speaking is saying, and it's meant to be Jerusalem, she's saying my children have died from the Lord. That, you know, a lot of times, you know, God's punishments are, and like I mentioned this in, in the last chapter, cruel. A lot of times they are, and the reason is because your sins are cruel. The worse your sins are, the worse punishment you're going to receive. And God's going to give you a just punishment. And because He's holy and righteous, He is not going to pity when that time comes. God is merciful, He's filled with mercy, and He'll give you as much mercy as He possibly can. But, but there is a time when there becomes... Uh, a point where God cannot extend to you grace and, and, uh, and there is no remedy. There's nothing to fix it. Over and over again, and I want to end with this, I want to try to remember to end with this in every chapter of the book in Lamentations because it's one of the major reasons why I want to pick the book out. It's a super negative book. That's why people avoid it. Why is it negative? Sin. It's because of sin. That's the reason why it's negative. Why should we read it and what should we walk away from it? Stay away from sin. It's negative in the sense that it talks about the problems and trials and troubles and the punishment and the anguish and the grief. 
The only reason that any of those things happened was because of sin. If you don't want those things, stay away from sin. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, God, we love you so much. We thank you for the word of God. We thank you for the clarity of your word. We thank you for the ability and the, and the, uh, the way that the Bible is formatted and structured so that we can rightly divide between things like good wine and bad wine. We love you so much, as I said. We, we thank you for everyone that was here tonight. We ask you that you would bless everyone. You bless our church. Help us to grow. Help us to preach the truth to uh, the, the dying city of Jacksonville to, to get p people saved and to get the gospel out to them. And help us to be a light here. We love you, as I said. In Jesus Christ's name, amen.